This Filmmaker IQ lesson is proudly sponsored by Rode Microphones, premium microphones and audio accessories for studio, live, and location recording. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. Today, we'll get into the basics of digital data storage, from how we count it, how we name it, how we store it, and finally, how we make files from it. Digital data at its heart is very simple. It's either on or off, one or zero. The binary number system that is central to modern computing can actually be traced back to Gottfried Leibniz with his On the Art of Combination, published in 1666. Leibniz was interested in creating a pure mathematical language guided by perfect logic. Now, towards his later life, the binary system came to adopt a quasi-religious mysticism with one being God and zero being the void. Now, it didn't work out so good for Leibniz, but when people started training machines to add, that's when binary really grew some legs. By being only one of two possible options, binary offered a level of precision that analog signals could never match. The smallest bit of information in binary is the bit. The bit can only express one of two states. It's either zero or one. When we add a second bit, we now have four possible states. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. If we add another bit, we now have eight possible states. Each new bit doubles the number of possible states to 16, 32, 64, 128, and 256. And now we arrive at our first marker, the byte, which is eight bits. Coined by IBM engineer Werner Buckles in July of 1956, a byte historically has been designated as any number of bits necessary to express a character. Now this meant it was hardware dependent with no definitive standard number. Early computers used four bits or six bits. When ASCII, a standard for encoding English text and numbers, came out in 1963, it was a seven bit system. So how did we get eight bits to the byte? Well, during ASCII's development, IBM introduced an eight bit extended binary coded decimal interchange code, which was quite popular. Into the 70s, 8-bit microprocessors such as the Intel 8008, the direct predecessor of the 8080, and the 8086, the precursor to the popular x86 line of, pop of processors, popularized the 8-bit standard. Now, in those early days, computer RAM memory was labeled by the exact number of bytes they contained, like 4096, 8192, or 16384. It was generally a power of two because that's what played nicely with the processor's architecture. But that numbering system wasn't going to work as memory got bigger and bigger. And in 1960, the International System of Units, abbreviated SI, formalized the metric system and naming practices for units. Although there was no SI unit for memory, computer manufacturers began to borrow prefixes like kilo and mega and giga describe computer memory and hard drive space, but there's just one problem. Some people use the letter K for kilobyte to refer to 1024 bytes. That's two to the 10th power. But SI unit prefixes for kilo is 1000 units, not 1024. Computer memory manufacturers who were tied to that eight bit architecture of the CPU well, they just started using capital K for kilo as a shorthand for 10,024. They would later use M for megabytes as 10,024 to the second power, and G for gigabytes as 10,024 to the third power. But hard drive manufacturers, well, they took a different tack. There was, a, there was no rule saying the size of the hard drive had to be a power of two. In fact, the very first commercial hard drive, the IBM 350, first shipped in June 1956 with 50 physical disk platters containing a whopping 3.75 megabytes. So to avoid the confusion of extra numbers that binary introduced, hard drive manufacturers used the SI unit prefix in the standard decimal format. 1K wasn't 10,024 bytes, but exactly 1,000. 
This dual definition between 10,024 and 1,000 became commonplace in the 70s, which is why even today, when you plug in your brand new 300 gigabyte hard drive into your computer, it will only show 279.4 gigabytes in Windows. It's not that they're cheating you, it's that the operating system counts in multiples of 1024, while manufacturers count in 1,000s. In 1998, the IEC, a governing board which sets standards for electronics, created a new prefix to try to clear up the confusion. Basically, you take the first two letters of the SI unit and add by, resulting in sizes like kibibyte, mebibyte, gibibyte, and tebibyte. A kilobyte still remains its SI decimal version, but a kibibyte adheres to the binary version. So we go from kilobyte at 1,000 bytes to megabyte at 1 million bytes to gigabytes at 1 billion bytes and terabyte at 1 trillion bytes. What's after that? Well, to help get a sense of size, let's compare these data sizes to a regular single layer DVD, which holds about 4.7 gigabytes. If we wanted to burn one terabyte onto DVDs, we would need 213 DVDs. If we stack them up, it would be just shy of one feet high. For comparison, if we were shooting uncompressed 4K raw, this would only give us about 34 minutes of shooting time. Let's use a very conservative 10 to one shooting ratio. That is for every finished movie of film, there's 10 minutes of raw footage. A two hour narrative would eat through almost 35 terabytes. In that case, our stack of DVDs would almost be three stories high. A more realistic 30 to one shooting ratio would get that stack up to eight stories. Uh, you can see why only major productions shoot in uncompressed raw, and even then, it's a lot of data to wrangle. Not impossible, as it's not being stored on DVDs, but there's a lot of data. So, what's after terabyte? The petabyte, 1,000 terabytes. Now, if we took every single feature film listed on IMDb and compressed each one to fit exactly on a single 4.7 gig DVD, we would have a little over 1.5 petabytes of information and a stack of DVDs as tall as the Patronus Towers of Kuala Lumpur. But social media is pumping out even more data. One full year of tweets weighs in at four petabytes. On average day in 2008, Google processes 20 petabytes of information. And according to a stock report in 2013, Facebook stores over 100 petabytes of status updates, photos, and video. At almost 84,000 feet, our stack of DVDs is now about the cruising altitude of the SR-71 Blackbird at the edge of the stratosphere. The next step up is the exabyte, 1,000 petabytes. Now, to create one exabyte, our stack climbed up to 159 miles, the same altitude that chimpanzee Ham reached an early space flight test on board Mercury Redstone 2 in January of 1961. 1,000 exabytes is a zettabyte. That's one sextillion bytes. The size of the entire web has been put at four zettabytes as of 2013. To put that all on DVD, would require a stack that's three times the distance from the Earth to the moon. Mark Lieberman calculated that if we digitized every single word spoken as 16 kilohertz, 16-bit audio, we would need 42 zettabytes, taking us now to six million mile stack. The view of Earth would look something like this, taken aboard the Juno spacecraft en route to Jupiter. And lastly, we reach our biggest name data size so far, the Yottabyte, one septillion bytes. That's one million, million, million kilobytes. If we were to store that much on DVDs, our stack would reach 158 million miles into space, which is more than the average distance from here to Mars. Even if we could get that qu a quantity discount of say 10 cents per DVD, which is a real bargain, this tower to Mars would cost over $21 trillion and weigh about a third as much as the moon. In our little thought experiment, we use DVDs to store the data. 
DVDs along with CDs and Blu-rays are optical mediums. That is, they bounce a light in the form of a laser off the surface of the disc. If there is a pit in the surface, the reader sees it as a zero or off. A land and the reader sees it as a one. Optical media has been a great way of distributing media from music to movies, but it's for the most part a write once deal. For storing data that we can work with like movie assets, we need something more malleable. Traditionally, this has come in the form of spinning hard drive disks. One or more platters coated with a magnetic material which can be written and read with a magnetic head. This magnetic head looks at the polarity of the material on the disk. If the polarity of a section remains constant, that bit is read as a zero. If there is a switch in polarity, a small voltage is created within the magnetic head as it sweeps over the surface. This spike in voltage, whether it's positive or negative, is read as a one. The newer type of memory storage is the solid state drive based on flash memory. First introduced in 1984 by Toshiba, flash memory is very similar in design to a MOSFET transistor with an addition of what's called a floating gate. Now you can think of a transistor as a switch. When we apply a positive voltage to the gate, the electric field opens a channel which allows current to flow between the source and the drain. A flash memory cell adds this floating gate between the control gate and a semiconductor. This floating gate is isolated with non-conductive oxide, which means once we put a negative charge on it, it should hold it indefinitely. Now, if this floating gate has no negative charge, the transistor will switch on with a certain positive voltage being applied to the control gate. If the gate has a negative charge, it will cancel off some of the charge from the control gate, which means we have to run a higher voltage through the control gate in order to open the switch. So, now in order to read this memory cell, we run a voltage that's somewhere in between. If the switch opens, we have no electrons stored on that floating gate, and therefore we have a one. If the, gate, if the switch is closed, that means there are electrons in the floating gate, canceling out the current from our control gate, and we have a zero. Now that's how you read a flash memory cell, but how do we write to it? Well, there are two ways. The first is through quantum tunneling. By applying a large voltage to the gate, we can actually get electrons to quantum tunnel through the oxide into the floating gate. The other way is something called hot electron injection, which again uses high voltage to get the kinetic energy of the electrons to power through that oxide substrate. Now I'll spare you and myself the details, but both of these techniques require higher voltage and oxide layer separating the floating gate eventually becomes damaged with all the electrons traveling through it. For this reason, flash memory can only be written so many times before it begins to fail. But the beauty of flash memory is that it can be made incredibly small. Remember that crazy tower to Mars of DVDs? If we instead create a Yottabyte using 200 gigabyte micro SDXC cards, the most compact data storage available as of this video, we would only need a pile of disks about one third the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza. When cameras started going digital, the solid state drive was the perfect replacement as we transitioned away from tape. Uh, there are many formats from the Panasonic P2 to Sony's memory stick and S by S systems. Some cameras even use computer SSD hard drives, but I want to focus on two particular types of flash memory that you'll see in professional and consumer cameras. The first is the CF card or compact flash card. First manufactured by SanDisk in 1994, the CF card is still widely used in photography and video equipment. It's a very robust card, and although you do have to be a little careful when pushing it into a reader or a camera as the contact pins do bend easily. A CF card's read speeds are either written as megabytes per second or as a value followed by an X. The X is a base of 150 kilobytes per second read speed. So a 200X means it's capable of being read at 30 megabytes per second. Now, a major factor in the read and write speed is the communication protocol, either PIO, Programmed Input Output Mode, 
or UDMA, Ultra Direct Memory Access Mode. PIO is for industrial use. For video and photography, you want UDMA. Now there are several modes available so far from zero to seven with the UDMA-7 supporting up to 167 megabytes per second. And again, that's only supporting the actual speed may be a lot lower than that. Now, very recently, a variation of the CF card, the CFAST card came on the market. These cards use a serial ATA bus rather than the parallel ATA bus that the regular CF card uses. This enables speeds up to 600 megabytes per second and is being used in some high data stream cameras, especially those shooting in RAW. The other popular format I want to talk about is the secure digital card or SD card. Now these cards come in four families, standard capacity SDSC, the high capacity SDHC, the extended capacity SDXC, and the secure digital in out, which is really more of an interface. SD cards are available in three size forms, standard, mini, and micro. Now, unlike CF cards, which can be a little confusing about their actual transfer speed, SD cards have class ratings that guarantee a minimum read and write speed. For most HD video applications, you'll need at least a class 10 or a UHS speed class one card, which guarantees 10 megabytes per second. For 4K, look for that little U symbol for the UHS speed class three, which guarantees 30 megabytes per second. Of course, these speed recommendations are only suggestions for compressed formats. Your camera may have specific requirements, so it's worth consulting the manual. There's just one final topic I want to briefly cover in this overview of storage. We've been talking about storing all those zeros and ones, but when you have a long string of them, how do you tell where the data starts and where it ends? How do we delineate one file from another? Well, that's where file systems come into play. There are many different kinds of file systems and they can differ in structure and logic, properties of speed, flexibility, security, sizes, and more. There are file systems for optical disks, for RAM, for tape disks, you name it. And we can go pretty deep into that rabbit hole. But for this discussion, let's focus on the disk file systems you'll likely run into and a little bit about them. If you're using an Apple product, your hard drive will be utilizing the Apple proprietary HFS Plus file system. Windows systems will be utilizing the Microsoft proprietary NTSF system. Unfortunately, these two file systems don't play nicely with each other. On Windows, you can't just plug in a Mac drive and expect it to be readable. Uh, luckily, there are software options that essentially translate the systems and allow one file system to read and write to the other. Now, flash media will most likely be formatted in the file allocation table, FAT system, such as FAT32. A relatively old file system, the maximum possible size for a file on a FAT32 file system is four gigabytes minus one byte. Cameras that record onto cards formatted with FAT32 will split up large files either at two gigs or four gigs in order to stay under that four gig limit. XFAT, which debuted in 2006 from Microsoft, does away with this file limitation and is the default file system for SDXC cards larger than 32 gigabytes. Windows and Mac systems can both read and write to flash memory that is formatted in FAT32 or XFAT. We are producing data at an astounding rate. How that data is stored is a challenge for today's computer scientists and engineers. If anything, they've come up with some amazing technologies. Data is the lifeblood of the digital filmmaker. It's key that we protect it, back it up, and when we're finished, archive it, which is quickly becoming its own challenge all by itself. But first, you have to get out there and make something great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.